Hello everybody. Um, this is another video from your Student Success Center um, and this is going over the breast and lymphatic system. It's kind of a quick overview of chapter 20. Um, we're going to talk a little bit of content review and do some practice questions at the end. So um, this is all things that will end up um, showing up on your exams um, and so make sure you pay attention and uh, understand these concepts, understand um, and memorize these small details um, talking about the breast and lymphatic system. So the biggest part that you need to know for your anatomy and physiology, um, talking about um, the milk line. So this is that line that extends from the axilla all the way down to the groin bilaterally. Um, this is typically where you're going to see any sort of supernumerary nipples. So if they have any extra um, nipples, it'll probably be typically along this, this line. Um, so that's something that you need to be aware of and that when you're assessing, um, you're looking for any supernumerary uh, nipples. And then the tissue types, there's a granular. This is what actually produces a milk production after a woman's been pregnant and they're lactating. Um, typically you have 15 to 20 lobes. Um, and then uh, your breast isn't actually fully completely developed until after um, you've had a pregnancy and delivered. Um, that's when that granular tissue is going to uh, mature. The fibrous tissue, that is what's going to provide support, so it's kind of like a, suspender, a suspensory ligament. It runs from the skin and all the way down through the breast and attaches onto the deep fascia of the muscle. Um, and so that fibrous tissue actually increases with aging, so that's something that you need to kind of remember and know the expected changes um, along um, all the age groups. Um, your fatty tissue, um, this is embedded um, in the granular tissue and this is actually going to decrease with age size. So um, the fatty tissue is actually um, what determines breast size. So a lot of women, um, especially women that are pregnant or are thinking about breastfeeding or um, weighing their options, they feel like they won't make enough milk because their breast size is, is too small. That they won't have enough um, and that's just it's not true that's not where breast size come from um, glandular tissue is where um, the milk production comes from and typically everybody has between 15 and 20 lobes uh, there's rare exceptions but uh, most people uh, no matter what their size of their breasts are still able to do produce breast milk so um, it's a bit of teaching that you can do for your patients and then um, kind of like I was saying, that fatty tissue, uh, that is going to decrease with age. So your fibrous tissue increases with age, fatty tissue decreases with age. Screening for cancer. Um, when we're doing inspection and palpation of the breast, we're going to note of any enlarged nympho enlarged lymph nodes um, and document if you see anything greater than one centimeter. Remember that one centimeter. Um, that's, that's the size that you're looking for. Um, and then knowing the difference between malignant um, tendencies versus benign tendencies and masses in breasts because it's very common to have um, breast uh, masses and it's uh, not necessarily a big red flag. And so Things that we're looking that are benign, they're going to be round or oval, firm. You can move them around. They're mobile. Um, they typically don't hurt or they're not um, tender to the patient when you're palpating. Um, and then some type, types of benign uh, masses, they may experience some painful or tenderness um, just right before their period starts. And so um, you want to ask them if they've experienced any changes in their breasts or um, uh, that correlate with their with their menstrual cycle. And then malignant uh, breast cancer, um, these are typically found in that upper outer quadrant. Um, so think your um, where you're placing your deodorant, right? Um, there's a ton of natural deodorants that are on the market now um, that don't contain uh, aluminum or um, any sort of other uh, things that can 
harm us or uh, hurt us. And so you're typically going to find those nodules kind of up in that upper outer quadrant um, up towards your armpit. Um, that's where most of these malignant tumors are going to be found. Um, they're going to be hard, Im immobile, unlike the benign tumors where you can move them around. Um, they're firm and fixed. Um, they're poorly defined borders, so it's not like that round oval. It kind of feels like there's a like a little pebble under the skin if it's benign, but um, it's really stuck to the tissue and it, it's not a perfectly round shape when it's um, you know the more serious kind that has malignancies. So um, this is something that we want to be able to uh, know the difference between um, and also we're assessing for any sort of um, prominent vein patterns because if it's malignant it needs a blood supply um, you're going to notice like unilateral um, veins that are more prominent on one side of the breast than the other and um, the orange peel skin that's a characteristic that you'll see um, with malignant type uh, breast cancer this is caused by uh, edema that's in the breast and so it's kind of pushing out on those pores and those glands um, so it looks exactly like an orange peel it has those big round um, dots that kind of looks porous um, and it's just from all the edema um, behind the breast tissue the retracted breast tissue that's also a sign of um, cancer especially if there's a change right if they've always had um, maybe inverted nipples or, or um, a retracted nipple then that's maybe just their normal anatomy that it hasn't changed but if there's some sort of change or there's some sort of dimpling in the actual breast tissue that's um, new it's a new onset that's something that we really want to um, document and um, refer and make sure that we get that tested. Mastitis, that's typically when you're going to see uh, it's an infection of the breast tissue. Um, most of the time you'll see that with breastfeeding moms. Um, it's very red, it's very swollen, it's very painful. Um, and so make sure you know the signs and symptoms of mastitis. They'll also um, you know, have fever, um, flu-like symptoms. You just don't feel great with mastitis. Um, and then the pageant's disease, that is the reddening and um, like kind of peeling, flaking of the skin around the, uh, the nipple. And this is uh, the characteristics of pageant's disease. So the redness and flaking, those are early signs of Pageant's disease, and sometimes that can go away, but it doesn't mean that the disease has gone away. Um, some of the later onset um, signs and symptoms are tingling, itching, increased sensitivity, um, it burns, there's some discharge associated with it. So um, we want to look for the early warning signs. If they come in complaining of any sort of redness or flaking of the, of the tissue around the nipple, um, then we need to kind of have our head on a swivel and be thinking about Paget's disease. So some of the most missed concepts um, for this chapter on test questions, um, talking about uh, gynecomastia. This is a normal finding that you will see in young men, but um, usually it's temporary. They kind of grow out of it once they turn um, into their 20s. Um, but if you notice this and see this on an older adult client, then we're going to think more of it may be caused by hormonal imbalances. So we want to get them tested and get their hormones checked to see if there's something else going on. Um, so know that if you see a test question and it's talking about gynecomastia um, in a young adult, that that's normal, but we want to correlate hormonal imbalances um, with an older adult if this is seen. And then breast self-exams, this is a really big topic um, and a, a, a teaching opportunity for our patients. Um, this is something that we want to teach them that they're going to do monthly, on a monthly basis. Um, when their breasts are going to be non-tender or swollen. So typically we want to teach them to do it right after their period has ended or right after their menstruation um, has stopped. And so um, this is important because we want to be able to 
um, teach them like the methods of the breast self exam. Those are important, but um, the real thing that we're teaching them is we want them to be able to deck to to detect any changes rather than doing the breast, breast self exam in the correct um, form or doing it regularly. It's much more important for them to be able to notice any sort of changes rather than drive home and really harp on, you have to do it monthly. Um, so that's the important takeaway of that. And then teaching to women who don't have their periods anymore or maybe are postmenopausal. Um, maybe they're on a birth control to so where they're not having monthly periods, we're going to teach them to do breast self exams on any given date of the month, a date that is meaningful for them. Maybe it's their birthday. Their birthday is on the 23rd, so um, they're always going to do their breast self exam on the 23rd of each month. Um, so that's how we would do teaching for a woman that um, isn't having regular periods anymore. And then if we are examining a woman and she is stating that she's had some painful tender breasts and um, the first thing that we want to assess is are there are those changes in, in painful um, uh, self at breast exams in correlation with their menstrual cycle um, then we're going to think if there's any sort of you know ebb and flow with that um, in correlation with her uh, period, then we're going to think fibrocystic breasts. Um, and that happens to more than half of women at some point in their life are going to experience this. So um, it's it's kind of in that category of normal finding. Um, it's not something that we would um, notify the physician or um, send for further testing because it's just um, a normal change in correlation to her menstrual cycle um, caused by hormonal changes. Um, so again, this is not something that we're typically going to um, go and biopsy or, or look at closely because um, if she's saying that these um, nodules or tenderness is, comes and go with, go with her menstrual cycle, then we're going to um, determine that that's horm hormonal changes. And then I also just put a note on here at the bottom um, to make sure you go and look through the normal growth and development through the lifespan. And so your chapters 31 and 32, uh, talking about developmental um, in young adults and adolescents, talking about breast development, and then also any sort of changes that you expect to see in an older client as well. So make sure that uh, you don't just know for a young, healthy, normal adult, um, but throughout the lifespan. Okay, so talking about nipple discharge, um, any sort of milky discharge, if a woman states that she's pregnant or um, is lactating and breastfeeding, that's obviously a normal um, finding, and so it's not, we're going to, you know, we're just going to move on from there. But if she is not, um, pregnant or breastfeeding or recently given birth um, then if she, and she's complaining of um, nipple discharge then we're gonna do a little bit more investigation and see is this caused by hypothyroidism, pituitary uh, tumors, oral contraceptives, antihypertensives can cause nipple discharge, um, other medications such as tranquilizers so um, we want to investigate that further and see if she's got any other sort of signs and symptoms or if she's stated that she's taking medications and, and what can be the cause of this. Um, if she's complaining of bloody discharge, then that could be um, a potential um, tumor in the milk duct and so it's causing trauma and irritation to um, the, the breast duct and then it's all connected and drained down and out and through the through the nipple. Um, so that's what we would expect to be the cause if she's complaining of bloody discharge. Any sort of greenish discharge is gonna you're gonna think um, a cyst or some sort of infection. And so um, if she's complaining of green discharge, make sure 
you're correlating that to a cyst. And then clear discharge, especially if she's only saying, it's only on my left side, um, then we should be thinking um, cancer. So whatever she's complaining of, um, we're going to collect or try to collect any of that discharge and then send it to the lab for a, a systolic a systologic evaluation. So um, other risk factors for breast cancer, um, these are the main ones that you really need to know. Gender, age, genetics, family history, personal history, um, early menstruation if she started her period before age of 12 or went into menopause after 55. Um, those are all risk factors, but those are things that we can't really change, right? That just uh, it is what it is. Um, but things that are um, other sorts of risk factors, no children or your first child after the age of 30, um, that is considered to be a risk factor for developing breast cancer. Um, Non-breastfeeding moms, um, there's a benefit to showing uh, breastfeeding does help reduce the risk of breast cancer and it's cumulative. So. Um, the longer that you breastfeed each child and the more children that you breastfeed um, actually ends up reducing your risk even more the, the longer amount of time that you are act actually lactating. Um, and then uh, consumption of alcohol, more than two drinks per day, that puts you at risk for breast cancer. And then um, excessive weight or um, obesity, that's going to put you at risk for cancer as well. Okay, so we have some practice questions. A nurse palpates the breast of a client for masses during a physical examination. The nurse knows that if a term tumor is malignant, which characteristics will be present? Select all that apply. So we have a regular shape, irregular in shape, well demarcated borders, hard and non-tender, rubbery and mobile, or fixed and under uh, to underlying tissue. So our key words, this is a malignant tumor, and which are the characteristics that we're looking for? So um, malignant means uh, the cancerous type. Um, I know that these are irregular in shape. Um, they are hard, but I can't really remember if they were tender or um, non-tender. Um, they are not mobile, so I can eliminate D, um, and I know they're typically um, fixed to surrounding structures. So um, the correct answers are A, C, and E. Malignant tumors are hard and non-tender and fixed to underlying tissues. And they are usually unilateral or with irregular borders um, all the other characteristics, those are going to be associated with um, benign breast disease. So make sure you have those straight in your head. Um, malignant are um, hard, immobile, fixed to surrounding um, tissue or soft tissue, um, poorly defined or irregular margins, um, hard and non-tender. Okay, so moving on to the next one. Um, a nurse examines a client diagnosed with fibroad fibroadenoma. Which characteristic of a lump should the nurse expect to find in a client? So let's look at our keywords. So um, we are looking for characteristics um, of a fibroadenoma. So is it round, firm, and well-defined, irregular, large, and not well-defined, round, elastic, and not well-defined, tender, mobile, and well-defined. So let's look at the correct answer, and it is A. So they are uh, lobular, oval, or round. They are firm, well-defined, seldom tender, and usually singular and mobile. Um, a regular hard, not well-defined masses is characteristics of a cancerous tumor. So 
Um, and the biggest thing that um, you can take away from this is making sure that you really do understand the difference between um, benign and malignant tumors, doing lots of these types of practice questions to, to help, help you differentiate the two. Okay, so a 50-year-old female presents to the healthcare clinic as a new client for a complete physical examination. Which, date, which data in her health history should the nurse recognize as a risk factor for the development of breast cancer? Um, late menarche, um, a nulliparity, early menopause, or low dose of birth control pills? So our key words are She's a 50-year-old woman, and we're recognizing these as risk factors for developing breast cancer. So remember, it was an early period um, that put them more at risk for breast cancer, and so we can eliminate A, um, and it was late menopause um, that put them at risk, so we can eliminate C, um, and I don't believe birth control was on that list, but this nulliparity, that's saying that she's had no pregnancies. Parity is pregnancy and null is none. Um, so our correct answer is B. No pregnancies or late age um, of birth for your first child after age of 30 are risk factors for breast cancer. Um, and remember, it's early menopause, or sorry, late menopause and early, and early um, menstruation. And then long-term use of high estrogen birth control pills um, have a slight increased risk for breast cancer, but not enough to, to make it on the list. So um, the never having any sort of pregnancies is when it, what's going to put her more at risk for developing breast cancer. Okay, a nurse teaches a group of young women about how to properly perform a breast self-examination. How should the nurse explain the best time to perform the examination? Right after the menstrual flow stops, on the third day after the menstrual cycle begins, on the 14th day of the menstrual cycle, or immediately before the menstrual cycle starts. So I feel like I mentioned this several times. Those are your key words and it's gonna be A, right after your, your menstrual flow stops. That's the best time to perform a breast self-exam. Um, that's when you're gonna have um, the lowest uh, hormone levels, um, and so you're gonna stop, um, uh, you're gonna do your breast self-exam typically between the fourth and seventh day of your cycle, if you're regular. <laughs> Um, a non-pregnant female presents to the healthcare facility and reports a new onset of breast discharge. The nurse assesses the discharge to be milky in appearance without breast tenderness or masses. What additional data should the nurse obtain from this client? Let's look at our keywords. So it's a new onset of discharge, so that's a keyword is the new onset. She's not have any sort of tenderness or masses associated with this, and so what else do we need to know? Environmental exposure to chemicals, prescribed medications such as antipsychotic agents, recent surgeries um, or trauma, uh, alcohol intake in excess of three drinks a day. So what is most likely associated with this um, discharge? And it's gonna be medications are you taking? Um, Haldol can actually cause this and so um, we want to do a full history of um, any medications she's taking that could cause this. Okay, while interviewing a client, a nurse asks the client whether she has never, if she has ever noticed any lumps or swelling in the breasts. What other areas associated with this possible risk for breast cancer should she ask about regarding the presence of lumps or swelling? So um, let's look at our keywords. What other areas are associated with possible risks for breast cancer should she um, ask about? Her underarm, her shoulder, her neck, or her abdomen. So I remember when I told you the most common site for you to feel any sort of masses are going to be that upper outer quadrant and that's on its way to the armpit and uh, you 
want to always think deodorant's bad, <laughs> deodorant's bad for you. Um, you're putting all those chemicals and stuff um, right under your arm and that's um, what can be causing uh, potential uh, breast cancers. And so under the arm is the correct answer. Um, the nurse is discussing a breast self-exam with a six-year-old woman. Which of the following should the nurse recommend? Perform the breast self-exam as soon as menstruation ceases each month, uh, picking a set date of the month that the client will remember on which to perform the breast self-exam, performing the breath breast self-exam annually on the client's birthday, or discontinuing the practice as she no longer leads, needs, as, lo as is no longer needed after menopause. Um, so she's a 60-year-old. Um, she is most likely not having her uh, menstruation period anymore. And so uh, we want to tell her to pick a set day um, each month and the client will remember to do the breast self exam. So that's how we're going to instruct women who um, no longer have a monthly period um, for whatever reason. We're just going to have them pick one day out of the month to do that. So a nurse is inspecting the client's nipples. Which of the following findings should the nurse regard as a cause for concern? And nipples that are nearly equal in size, supernumerary nipples, a recent a recently retracted nipple that was previously averted, nipples that have, sorry, have been flat for many years. There's a typo. Um, so our key words, we're inspecting the nipples and what is the most cause for concern. So I know supernumerary nipples are not quote unquote normal, um, but um, it might not necessarily be a cause for concern but any sort of changes are. So a recently retracted nipple that was previously adverted, that is something that is a cause for concern I want to assess further and um, potentially send her to get that um, biopsy. Um, so a recently retracted nipple that was previously averted suge suggests malignancy. C is the correct answer. Alrighty, that's the end. Um, hopefully that was helpful um, in narrowing your studying and making sure that you really understand the concepts that you will be tested on and that you will see again. Um, so uh, please set an appointment with us if you feel like you need a little bit of extra content review um, or you can also always schedule an appointment to help with study skills or test taking strategies. Um, we also review your exams um, after you take the exam and you can look over specific questions and kind of go over some content review. We're doing that in group settings and individual settings, so um, we really encourage you to do it in the group setting first, but if none of those times work for you um, or if you feel like you want um, a closer look at your exact exam, we can always do that as well. So hopefully this helped. Um, thank you for watching and good luck to you.